I'm lost. I'm lost in a wood in Sussex, in mid Sussex, not far from Petworth, in a place called Ebono Common. And it's lovely. It's kind of what you would think of as your classic English woodland. It's the hundred acre woods. There are flowers coming up and there are tinkling rills and it, it couldn't be more idyllic. 500 years ago, hang on, let me do the sums. 500 years ago, this was the site of Ebono Furnace and there were things that pumped air into blast furnaces. It was an industrial wasteland and now it's... It's been reclaimed completely. Yeah, by no. time, really. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. It, it's, it's impossible to imagine what it would have been like here 500 years ago. There certainly wouldn't have been many trees growing up like they are now, but there would have been presumably hundreds of people tramping about. It certainly wouldn't have been quite so quiet as it is today. For this week's Open Country, I've come to Sussex, once the centre of English iron making, once the centre of the English arms trade clearly not anymore. Now it's pretty and I've come to meet Sussex naturalist Richard Jones. We've emerged by this beautiful pond. Pond wildlife is, is incredibly diverse. It's very difficult to see because most of it of course it's invisible under the surface. But we can poke around in the shallows a bit and splash about but so much of it is just invisible in the centre. Uh, squidgy corners that's, that's actually where it's easiest to find wildlife. This is not, as it were, a natural pond. No, where we are in Sussex especially, the landscape's very sort of wrinkled and there would have been plenty of streams running through it, but not ponds. So in nature, ponds are, are actually rather scarce and very ephemeral. They very quickly oh. become bunged up with reeds and plants, water lilies, and then the sallows and willows come in and they invade it. And 50 years on, it's scrub. A hundred years on, it's back to woodland or, or whatever, it, it's vanished. But here, an, a man-made pond yeah. is, uh, it's been here for several hundred years, it probably lasts for several hundred more, and that has a different character. One of the things that is very different now to when the furnace pond was made is that it's now encroached by trees, and I suspect at the time it would have been completely clear. That will actually have a significant impact on the invertebrates. And, and wildlife in the water because the leaves falling into the water cause bacterial decay and they use up the oxygen and that's why you get if you look at the edge you can see the sort of black wood mulch uh, and leaf litter that's that's going sort of black and if you were to step in that you would probably get quite a sort of smelly ooze come up luckily the pond's quite big so you've got quite a lot of open water and I can see there are water lilies that's always a good sign the water is quite clean and clear. Oh, is it? Quite often, if you find a pond in a woodland, it, it looks nice to start with, but you, you suddenly realise it's actually black and fairly lifeless because there's no oxygen in the water, because the bacteria have used it all up. And you get a few fly larvae, but probably no water beetles, no newts, no frogs. How long does it take nature to reclaim, to get it into this state? It really what? only takes a few years. Does it? possibly even a few months. The moment that activity stops, there are seeds dormant in the soil. Seeds come falling in, blowing in. But the moment the human activity stops, off they go. That's the sort of time zero, as it were. Four or five hundred years later, it's not quite primordial woodland, but it's as near as the sort of natural woodland that would have been in this area hundreds, if not thousands of years before. Yeah. Sussex has got to be one of the most heavily wooded counties of, of England. Yeah, I think that's partly because between the North and South Downs, the weald that you have, it's quite uneven country. The soil is quite acid, which is why you've got lovely heaths with heather growing everywhere, which of course is notoriously bad for agriculture. But yeah, yeah the, the woodland would have been here because it was the least attractive area to actually farm, to plough, because it's so muddy and squelchy everywhere. So this whole area is now, from bleak industrial landscape, is now a nature reserve run by the Sussex Wildlife Trust, which perhaps all bleak industrial landscapes will end up 
Is there anything about an iron-rich landscape like this one that encourages particular kinds of wildlife or particular plants? There is. It's very subtle, though. I don't think you could go to um, an iron-rich pond and say there are water beetles here but not in this one over here. But you will get slightly different species, and certainly in the ponds of the Sussex Weald, there are a, a few species of water beetle none of which have English names. Hydroporus longicornis is one that only occurs in a few ponds on the Sussex Weald. And that's possibly because it's, it's somehow evolved a tolerance for the iron in the water. But it's not going to have um, as big an ecological effect as, say, other chemicals, which are the results of pollution. And it, it actually much less of an effect than simply leaves falling in. So there will be different species, but it's very subtle. And it, it will be the sort of thing that only an expert peering down a microscope looking at individual hairs on the individual legs of water beetles or flies or whatever would be able to distinguish. Yeah, because in a way, given that this was an iron-rich landscape with lots of trees which would have occasionally burnt, I guess that the pollution isn't one of the things that's left from... 500 years ago iron workings. Do you no. know what I mean? There was iron here and there, was, there would have been charcoal. And... Yeah, it's a slightly different idea of pollution to the one we have nowadays. Certainly those pollutants would have had an effect on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis here. And they're nowhere near as toxic as, say, the runoff from a road, which has petrochemicals or metallic substances in them which can do real damage into in waterways and also much less of an effect than agricultural runoff from fertilizers which get into waterways and cause algal blooms and things like that. Now what's that? What's this slag. big lump of st- that slag? That is slag. Unfortunately it's what we would call undiagnostic slag so it doesn't tell you what process it belongs to. But we can narrow it down a little yeah, yeah. bit. We can say that it's, it is possibly from a forge, which would have been what they had here, or it could have been from a bloomery, yeah. which they also might have had here. So I'm going to get you to tell me about here before we go back to the exciting different <laughs> Serena Blair. Right. Yeah, no, no. Fanboys, is... with three fanboys here. <laughs> I am in, where am I, the Ashdown Forest? Ashdown Forest, that's right, yes. Newbridge. Newbridge. Yep with Jeremy Hodgkinson and Jonathan Pruce. Newbridge Furnace. Here. Newbridge Furnace was a furnace that was built in 1496 because Henry VII was about to engage in a war against Scotland and he needed to make military materials for that war. This furnace was established for that purpose. It's worth pointing out that we're in the middle of a beautiful bluebell wood. It doesn't look like a, what we would think of as a furnace, and or a blast furnace in particular. No. We are actually standing in what would have been the pond, so that water power could be obtained to pump air into the furnace through bellows or operate a hammer. The whole landscape 200 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, this was somebody's workplace. The landscape around here was transformed by that need to to work the land, to produce iron, to dam up the rivers, to cut the trees down, to make the charcoal, to dig the holes in the ground to get the iron ore out, and to make the trackways that they move the raw materials and the products. Gentlemen, I've told you I'm a fanboy. I've watched you trying to build a... the, the, the Wild and Iron Research Group building a bloomery on YouTube. Yep. <laughs> My wife caught me. You know, what's this you're watching? <laughs> yep, it is fiendishly difficult to do. The group's been experimenting with trying to make iron. We do do make iron from time to time. It's, but it's not, it's, you know, we've lost that art. When you think Sussex, what do you think? You think maybe the Downs? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's, it's, the Downs are prominent, but the Weald is... It's a different place. Kipling called it the secret weald because, you know, well, you've discovered how secret it is because it took you a while to get here. <laughs> and, we were a bit lost. Yes, and it, it's easy to get lost in the weald because you don't see the horizon in the weald. 
because you drive for miles and miles and miles and you're driving through woods really mm. for a long way you know it, it looks the same it's where it gets its name you know wield comes from the same origin as the german word vault for forest and the, the iron industry drew its resources from that but also it remained wooded as a legacy of the iron industry as well furnaces like the one here at newbridge could consume the wood from two and a half thousand acres of a coppiced wood over the 15 years that it took to regrow it. Two so and a half thousand two acres. Two and a half thousand acres. So it was, uh, you know, the, and there were, there were 50 furnaces working in the Weald when the, there was a survey in 1574, you know, and 50 furnaces and another 50 forges which had to be there to convert the iron from cast iron to wrought iron and that was another 1500 acres of woodland. I think they reckoned that the height of the industry probably nine to ten thousand people might have been involved in Gosh. it in some way or other. Gosh, uh, uh, I mean that, that's a lot of people and and, mm -hmm. and you know vital to the economy of the area so mm -hmm. Sussex was arms manufacturers. Absolutely <laughs> yes. Very much yeah. so yeah. right and right through until the second half of the 18th century. The Seven Years' War, 80% of the guns for the Navy were being produced here in the Weald then. How far did the armaments go from this well, bosky? <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the armaments that were made in the Weald tended to go wherever the, the English went and then subsequently the, the British went so that if you want to go and see at the largest collection of iron guns produced in the Weald, the best place to go is Barbados. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah, because when ships landed in Barbados on their way to destinations in the Caribbean, they were required to leave behind a gun and some ammunition to fortify the island, and the, the place is absolutely stiff with the things. My name is Marchant, and I knew that my ancestors had come to Sussex from Namur. Right. But I couldn't work out for the life of me why on earth anybody would come from Belgium to Sussex in about 1500. Right. It's to do with technology transfer. Blast furnace technology was mastered by people in the Low Countries and northern France and large numbers of them came over, presumably, including your own ancestors. From yeah. the bits I've seen, we're on the, is it the Denizens list? Right, oh, likely. Right. Yeah. Yes, okay. the Denizens were, were, Denization was something which was required of aliens, as they were called, foreigners, who came to this country and towards the end of Henry VIII's reign, he was in conflict with the, with France and Frenchmen in this country had to obtain letters of denization. Lists were made up, drawn up at that time, of the people who came over and those lists very helpfully gave us the names of the places where they came from, which in most instances were in an area of France called the Pays de Bray, mm. which is... Dieppe way. And it was to that area that iron workers from Namur travelled in 1450 and set up an ironworks near Beauvais and then iron workers from there came over here and helped to establish the iron industry of the wheels. So what we're saying is is that about 500 years ago my ancestors came over bringing a new technology and everyone went oh I'm not sure foreigners you're gonna to have to register in order to be here. That's about it. And, yeah. and pay a bit of extra tax. Yes, that's right. I shrug my shoulders. There's a, there's a certain a certain familiarity Does it with not? the process. Yes. <laughs> oh dear. Yes. <laughs> that's a piglet. It's a piglet because iron was cast from blast furnaces. They would tip the molten iron out into a trench and make what they called a sow, and then be, these would run off. And it would look like a big pig with lots of little pigs. So, th so that's pig iron. Yeah. Isn't that fantastic? It looks like a, it almost looks like a sword or a yeah. cardboard. Can I have a, yeah, a go? Yeah, of course you can. 
Yeah, because that's quite heavy, isn't it? It weighs more than my baby did. To a workout, yeah. It was certainly weighs more than was, my baby. She did. was two and a half yeah. kilos, so in baby weight, honestly, I reckon that's two babies. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, it's about two babies, two and a half babies, <laughs> maybe. It's <laughs> a new method of scale. Yeah. In fact, I probably should say I'm in the Anne of Cleves house in Lewis with Emma O'Connor. So this is one of our. Bigger right, okay, so th this is, you know, what I would have called an ingle nook fireplace, even It though. is. Yeah. Down hearth cooking, which means you're cooking on the hearth. It's got a spit. It's got a spit. A it's cauldron. A cauldron used all cast iron, all produced within the wheel, probably. Is it? Is it? Yeah, so this is a, a chimney crane and would allow you to manoeuvre, obviously, incredibly hot and very heavy and ultimately quite dangerous large vats of liquid around because in these you'd have hot water going or a broth but also you may then have a smaller cauldron or pot suspended inside to cook more uh, than yeah. one object at like a, a more... bain marie yes more also let's face it you know for eye of newton skin of toad and all <laughs> of that <laughs> yeah every witch has got to have one of those i suppose lots and lots of domestic utensils were made of iron Wheels and iron. Absolutely. The fire back, which is, well, goodness knows how many babies that weighs. Weighs a lot of babies. Too many babies to move. Because uh... normally open country's recorded outside. Yeah. We're not going to be able to carry this out, are no, we? No, not. <laughs> Even a small one weighs, I would say, a good 10 to 15 babies. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's probably 100. So as well as pouring molten iron into a trench and creating a sow and her piglets, it was also possible to make a mould with planks of wood and then the design would be pressed into the sand at the bottom. Oh. So this, the yeah. back is never flat. I saw one in a pub quite yeah. recently. Clearly, you know, very old. And it had been, like, it had been mended. There were bolts oh, in yeah. it and holding they it together. They are mended a lot. They were used, brought into widespread use with the introduction of chimneys into houses, say the 15th to 16th centuries, that's when chimneys first appear. Really? And, yeah. Blimey. Yeah. So before that, there was a hole in the roof? A hole in the roof, yeah. So with the introduction of chimneys, you needed to protect the chimney fabric, brick or stone, and so the fireback did that, but also the fireback radiated the heat back out into the room. Museum curators aren't, aren't meant to have favourite objects. But amongst <laughs> like my, babies. Amongst my favourite is one of is this one, Isn't with the beautiful? hand imprint from probably the blacksmith, the founder S making it. So you would have put your hand into That's the it. green sand. Yep. So you get those executive pin things that you put your, well you push your face yes. into it, and then the cast iron is poured into it. And there's a pair of compasses there. Gosh. And it's a very and that's a piece of rope. So quite simple, ordinary everyday objects used to create a pattern of pair of scissors, scissors, knives. It's extraordinary. One thing I've now learned is that scissors haven't changed at all no. since the 16th century. I've got More a pair right. of those. Yeah. yeah, they yeah. don't change. So some firebacks are just purely decorative. Some are personalised. Some can be political. Some, for example, you could interpret this as being a political fireback. It commemorates the Lewis Mortars that were burnt at the stake. Oh gosh, oh that's tasteful isn't it? So there's <laughs> <laughs> there's a stake with some people chained to the stake being burnt at, being the, burnt at the stake yeah. behind your fire. Yeah. <laughs> Not very helpful to be speechless on the radio is it? <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I am. That's incredible. Yeah. Am I, oh, the cheerful glow from the fire. From the fire. We've arrived at Glind Forge for a bit of hot iron fun. You can hear it clanking. And it's a beautiful, fabulous, purpose-built arts and crafts building, dated 1907, with a great wooden horseshoe framing the doorway. You would have no mistake what this was for. And now, I'm going to meet Ricky Delaney, who's a blacksmith, still working in the heart of the village. So what are you making? Just some tiny little leaves that are going to go on a gate. Yeah. 
But as you can see, they're all, they're all different, which is something you don't get if you buy off the shelf. I mean, all right, it says 1907, but not much would have changed here, surely, from... No. The way, the way that blacksmiths in Sussex work, most of what they do is what they'd have done two, three hundred years ago. Yeah. So they're not using electricity to weld. They're welding in the forge to create stuff like the gate behind you, which is yeah. as they would have done it hundreds of years ago, which creates a better product and more beautiful, in my opinion. Yeah. How do you know when you've got it to the right heat? Uh, well, you basically you forge at a yellow, you form at an orange. But it's by colour? By colour, yeah. You go to how, if you hit cold metal and you underprice a job, basically, they're the two things that send you to how. But um, <laughs> the more times you burn a bit of metal, the more times you're going to start thinking about how hot it is while it's in the fire. Yeah. It's magic, Rick. It's, ma it's magic. Yeah. This is alchemy. This is the beginnings of science. You guys were the first people who learnt to manipulate this stuff. Yeah. It's a sort of mad miracle. I am an anorak, as you yeah, can see. I, <laughs> I went to college 27-ish years ago, and um, I was I didn't go to learn blacksmithing. I went to learn some metalworking skills, and uh, two weeks into the whole course, I was I was smitten. I don't want to do anything else. No. No. If you enjoy getting dirty and you enjoy working hard and going home with a few blisters and feeling like you've achieved something at the end of the day, then it's the job for you. If you feel my hands, I'm oh, like a, yeah. a dowager nice. duchess. <laughs> Beautiful, isn't it? When it, it starts, is. I just every time that starts, I go, "Oh, that's." And so, so that's the thing which now, which they built the hammer ponds for. That's what they built hammer ponds in Sussex for, was to build a big water wheel. Yeah. To make Trip a hammer. Hammers. Mind you, that's elegant and beautiful too. But the, I guess the ponds are prettier, even than an all days <laughs> yeah. and onions. Yeah. yeah. What I'm going to do reluctantly <laughs> is something with my hands other than making tea and rolling cigarettes <laughs> okay we're going to make a square point yeah and then make it into a round tape okay right. nothing can possibly go wrong no it is quite meditative blacksmithing because you can't really think about anything else while you're blacksmithing otherwise it's not going to work and you'll hurt yourself so believe in yourself i don't believe in myself <laughs> And I don't believe in myself for very good reasons. <laughs> so the metal's hot. Yeah. It's coming out the fire. If you lift the hammer higher, yeah. then you're going to get more weight down on the... You're going to let the tool do the work. Yeah. There you yeah. go. That's a start. What? That's not good, is it? <laughs> it's not a spare <laughs> What fascinates me about this landscape is, is what's been lost, really. You can hunt for treasure, you can hunt for, for what iron made and for where the, the foundries were and the forges were, but what's been lost is the knowledge of how to produce iron from the ground. There's still people hitting hot metal, but it's made elsewhere. The landscape has fallen asleep again, and what's left are the birds. <laughs>